when I was younger, the saying was, nothing good happens after nine. So I guess, <laughs> I guess it's just been pushed yes, back further, midnight, <laughs> whatever. Yes. Uh, but just know your time, right? <laughs> know your time limit. Hey friends, thank you for joining us for another exciting edition of The Link. I am pretty fired up about today's episode. If you are single, you have tuned in to the right show today. We're going to talk about dating. You know, dating is one of those things that is oftentimes a taboo topic, somewhat awkward for some people to talk about, but it is so important. And what we're going to do today is kind of recontextualize it, taking it from all of the weirdness or awkwardness and casting it in a really positive light. So let me just say that if you have the ability right now to stop for a moment and share this on your own personal pages, I would love for you to do it because I think this is an important conversation. And I'm pretty fired up to have some guests with me as well who are going to help to have this conversation quite honestly, because it's been so long since I've been single and dating. And so they're a little bit more in tune with that. Patrick McElrath, who's one of our uh, associate pastors at our Detroit campus. He is uh, a huge blessing. He's right now engaged to Jen. Yeah. And I think you've gotten permission to be on the show. Is that I right? Have, yeah. So she has blessed me to be here. So <laughs> that's good. That's good. And so we'll make sure that you stay out of trouble. But uh, Pat, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then Emily, who I've just gotten a chance to meet, New Roth, who's over at our Royal Oak campus and uh, has been married for one year. Is that right? That is right. Yeah, that's right. The pandemic year. So that means you got <laughs> five years of marriage in 12 months. Right. Uh, exactly. But I'm so excited for you to be here. How how you doing, Emily? I'm doing really great. I'm excited to be here, too. Thanks Good. for having me. Good. Well, it's great to have you. And then Taylor, Taylor Lehman, who works with our student ministry here at Troy. We're so happy to have you, bro. You're such a huge blessing. You and Haley moved here from Indiana. And uh, still, who's your fans, I'm assuming? Boiler up. Definitely oh, Boilermakers all the way. Oh, so. man. <laughs> you know what? The, but the blood of Jesus just covers <laughs> all sin, you know? Uh, but uh, Taylor loves our, our students here, but also uh, has been married. How long have you guys been married? We've been married two years. So two just years. celebrated that in December. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Veterans. That's true. All right. I, you know, you're not allowed to write the book till you're five. Oh, okay. All right, you're five. Let's talk about dating a little bit, Pat, though. Uh, you know, obviously it's changed a lot. Yeah. You know, I've been married for 23 years. I think about the big book when I was uh, dating was I Kissed Dating Goodbye by Joshua Harris. And everybody had promise rings and we're talking about courtship instead of dating. And there was certainly not any thought of meeting online and social media and all of that stuff. Uh, you know, but that is so uh, normal in, in your world and with your generation. So if you could just kind of talk a little bit about your thoughts about navigating the dating landscape in this uh, current reality. Yeah, I mean, I'm not far behind you in that regard. Like I was at Spring Arbor and uh, I mean, Taylor was at Indiana Westland. He knows the small Christian college culture. Yeah. Ring by spring. That's right. And if you, <laughs> that's like, right. If you right. walk the P loop with a with yeah. a girl or a guy, um, that means you're essentially on your way <laughs> to marriage. And so, right. um, even from like my time in college to now with social media, um, the game has absolutely changed for sure. Um, when I think about social media in terms of relationships and, and dating. Um, I think that there are definitely some pros, and I think that there are definitely uh, some, some cautions. And like the pros, I mean, some of my closest friends actually in life uh, met their spouse online. Wow. Um, a couple of my really good friends from the Detroit campus uh, met on a couple of different dating apps. Um, my roommate actually in college, uh, Jeremy, we were roommates after college as well. And I'll never forget, um, we were at home and our buddy Fillmore, who also lived with us, was like on a FaceTime with a couple friends that he had met through Instagram. Yeah. And um, we walked in through the kitchen and Jeremy like looked at the screen and he was like, oh, what's up? And they started talking and the next thing you know, like him and one of the like ladies from the call were like connecting through Instagram. And now they're married with a, a daughter living in California. Wow. And so, like, there's definitely, like, pros to social media, right? All I we mean, had was MySpace, so we didn't really <laughs> yeah, have yeah, that way ability way to do that. Way harder. I mean, <laughs> even, like, even, like, FaceTime, 
um, when Jennifer and I started dating, like I'm actually quite a shy person. Um, it takes a lot for me to like get up and even be on camera. And so like Jen like loves FaceTime and I was not used to that. And so we were kind of talking and hanging out and I get this FaceTime call and I remember being like, I feel so uncomfortable right now. Like <laughs> I, I would rather just like talk on the phone. Even that makes me feel uncomfortable. And yet fast forward two years now and, and FaceTime has been such an instrumental aspect in even our own relationship. And so I think that there are definitely aspects of technology um, that are uh, incredible for people trying to connect. And it also, you know, the, the broad range, right? Like before, maybe you can just only connect with somebody from a small group or from church or from work. And now you have the ability to meet someone across the country or even across the world and engage. And yet, I don't know, at the same time, I think social media is and can be like a, a pressure cooker. And you go online and you look at someone's life and you think to yourself like, oh, I could never be with this person or I don't have what it takes to do that or you log on and you see somebody else's dream life happening and it can put you into this place of, I mean, why would I even, why would I even try? And, yeah. and so when I think about dating and social media, like, I don't know, people just can just take their time, right? And, we talked a little bit about it before we even started, I think, but like, I see so many people who post something right away, or people in their life are like, you gotta, you gotta get this online, you gotta get Facebook official. Yeah. And, I'm, and it's like, no, you don't actually have to get Facebook official. Like, the minute you take something from like your own private life and you publicize it, yeah, it's, it's fun and exciting, but you're you also know. inviting in <laughs> Yeah, and the funny thing is, is that oftentimes people do that and then complain yeah, yeah, that everybody's yeah. in their personal Everyone's life. And it's like, you, you know, I got a buddy of mine who has this saying, Chris, I want to always be a half step behind. And I love that thought. Like, I don't have to be always out front in everything. It's okay to kind of sit and wait a little bit, you know. I, I don't know the term for this, but uh, it's also the risk of how many times people set up these fake accounts, right? These fake accounts, yeah. and you, you're not even, yeah, yeah. catfishing, <laughs> where you, where you uh, think you're in a relationship with someone. And uh, it was a few years ago where uh, probably one of the more famous cases nationally of that is uh, this uh, real prominent linebacker from uh, Notre Dame uh, had, uh, was almost in the Heisman Trophy running and uh, thought he was in this like great relationship and the person, night before the Heisman supposedly committed suicide and come to find out it was uh, not the person he thought and he was really emotionally taken advantage of. And so, you know, we do have to be careful and we do have to vet, but yet we can't lament, right, the technology. I often say this from a pastoral perspective, that technology, uh, social media is a wonderful supplement, but not a substitute for like in-person relationships. So. Um, don't lament it, it seems like you're saying, yeah. but make sure you're careful as you, yeah. as, you, as you use it. Taylor, you know, I think about how many singles are watching, yeah. and let me just say, if you're married, it's okay to date and, and be married, that's a good thing too. We'll come back to that, right? But a lot of singles are, are, are maybe watching, they're frustrated, they feel like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm alone, uh, I have not been able to find that person, maybe right. even getting pressure as you get a little bit older, um, and, and this whole conversation may feel a little bit weird. What would you recommend they do in the season of waiting for God to send that right person? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question and something that I resonate with. I'm sure you guys have plenty of friends who are in that situation now. I have a couple close family members and friends who are experiencing that, and they do want relationship, and they are longing for companionship, and I think it is difficult because you are longing for that, and, and how do you be content in the, in the singleness, and for whatever reason, that person hasn't come along. And so getting married two years ago, I was talking to my buddy, and he got married at the same time, and one of the things that we talked about was don't settle. Like, yeah. don't settle, because there's so many questions and things that arise every day, whether it's where your money's going, where your time is being invested, then much less, we don't have kids yet, but how do, how do we train up our kids? Yes. And having someone who comes at it from a, a Christian worldview and who loves Christ, 
gives peace and, and I can trust in that, but it's, there's still difficulty at times, there's tension. And so not having someone who is trusting the Lord would be really difficult. Um, and then I think the other thing that I would say is for my single friends who um, are still looking for someone, one of the things that I really admire is when they invest and, and spend time serving and pouring into, especially into ministry. I have a buddy who, who goes here who, you know, he's, he's 30 years old and, and he's still looking for someone, but he has, he has poured time into student ministry, kids ministry, and I came here newer than he was, and I started meeting all these people that were like, oh yeah, my, bu- my buddy Ryan, he's poured so much into me. Wow. And his, his house has become this hub where guys go and hang out. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the beauties of not having a, a spouse or uh, you know, children to come home to. You don't have to have that responsibility. So you can go and invest in, in other people. Yes. And, yeah. and so I think probably just, yeah, investing that time. Yeah, I think that Paul talks about singleness in 1 Corinthians 7, like it is the thing to want, right? Like, I think that Paul would make the argument that you only trade your singleness and all of that freedom if it's going to mean the multiplication of the glory of God. Like, I believe we could glorify God better together, so I'm willing to give that up. Because why else would you give up controlling your own money? Right. controlling your own right, time, right. being able to do what you want when you want. Like there are so many liberties that come along with being single, but for whatever reason, our culture has made it something to l- lament over. Um, and so I love what you're saying. Like, hey, um, you know, have joy, um, invest your life into what matters most, you know? Um, I think for, for my wife and I, one of the things that we did before we got married, was uh, we went to some mentors and uh, we made a list of things we wanted to accomplish before we got married. Uh, Debt we wanted to pay off and books we wanted to read and stuff. And uh, you can go too far with that if you're doing it alone, but with some good godly mentors, it might be a helpful thing. All right, Emily, I wanna hear you talk about you and your hubby. Yeah. Uh, You guys obviously uh, have uh, uh, survived the, the first year, so I'm assuming that you pick the right one. Uh, but you know, when you're, when you're thinking about uh, getting married, one of the tough things in dating, right, is prioritizing that relationship with God. Uh, talk a little bit about how you guys did that. Yeah, so um, when he and I met, I actually met him in the church um, and he, I lead a small group at Woodside Royal Oak and um, he was one of the people in our group. Um, and when we first met it, you know, I, both of us talked about like not having like an attraction or, um, you know, it was just, he was really, he was new to the area and he was really just interested in finding community and, um, my heart for him. I just really wanted him to connect with the guys in our group. And that was just genuine. And, um, through that, uh, we really just got to know each other, like within our small group. And um, I started to pick up on when I think he was pursuing me and I was getting really anxious and, you know, it was just um, a lot to, you know, it's scary, um, especially just being in, in small groups together and you don't want to ruin any of that. Um, so he, he eventually asked me out um, and I, I said yes. And we had our first date um, and it was great because we just really were friends first already. And so um, it was just really easy to, to talk with him. Um, he asked such great questions and was really just pursuing me and just showing his interest in me, and um, which was very different from what I have experienced in the past in dating. Um, and so once we kind of really felt like, and we were both pretty open, like, you know, we wanted to date intentionally and um, we both loved the Lord and we're in the church and we served and stuff. And so we actually went to our pastor and it was only like date three, I remember, um, where we just kind of let our pastor John know, you know, that we were dating and we just wanted to ask him if he had any resources for us. And he had emailed us uh, 
like checklist on like preparedness for marriage, <laughs> date three. And yeah, so I was yeah. like, my heart sank <laughs> when I got that email. And I was like, what Don't is forget this? he is Dr. John Morales. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And um, I was like, oh my gosh, like what is this guy thinking? Like, you know, I, I had this idea of my mind of like, you know, I'm looking too forward before he is maybe. Yeah. And, but he, he loved it. He was so excited to like talk through these questions and like, you know, it really just opened up um, great conversation for us. And, um, and then Pastor John also recommended uh, the meaning of marriage book in the same email. Um, and so he, he was very much, right <laughs> yes. Um, so he was very much, you know, like super excited to see us together and to be dating, but he was, you know, um, really, I appreciated his, his wisdom in, um, you know, ha having these deep conversations and to prepare ourselves for marriage. And so we actually started reading that book together early on in our dating season. And so you guys were really ready. Let, let me just say this. There's three things that I love about your answer, right? First off, that you guys met in group, right? Like that is a sweet group sales pitch. Like join a group, get a spouse. We're gonna have to change all of our marketing materials for that. But no, I do think that groups are great for community and friendship and relationship, right? And we all need that. Doesn't always mean marriage, but groups are great. Second thing that I love about your, your uh, answer is that in many ways, John and Anna become almost like a mentor couple. And I think we underestimate that. And for those of us who are married, that's such a huge role that we can play for our single brothers and sisters. And this is part of the reason why I don't think we need to isolate everything, like singles over here, married over there. I think there needs to be community, right, with people of different like status, because we can really benefit one another, right? But the third thing that I love is that it sounds like your relationship started out in God so it's easier to maintain that, right? Like if you start out with, um, you know, the word of God centerpiece, you know, uh, through, through your relationship and then just kind of build from there, you know? Um, I would love to hear you guys talk to a little bit about, man, um, this, this whole conversation about purity, right? Because that's a big, big thing. And I know uh, all of you guys have to uh, deal with that and so, um, maybe Taylor, you can share a little bit of thoughts that you have about uh, purity, but I'd love to hear from all of you guys. Yeah, I had, I, I think I have two thoughts, um, and I'm glad we're talking about it because everybody deals with this when they're dating. I know I definitely went through it with my wife, um, and I think one of the, the biggest things is just grace, like, because there are, are times when, you know, maybe you did mess up, and you went further than your boundaries. And all of a sudden you start to live in that shame. And it's almost like you want to isolate yourself from God. And it, but it's so true that his mercies are new every day. His grace does abound. And we can live and operate out of that. And so at any time, it's like you can start fresh. You can start new with yeah. God. And then kind of getting a, a game plan when you're dating. Um, I think I heard the quote that, if you don't plan, you're planning to fail. Yeah. Um, so it's important that, that both of you uh, are kind of coming together on this. And I know, especially for me and my wife when we were dating, it wasn't a one-time conversation uh, on, on boundaries and how we wanted to honor God in this. It was, we had this conversation a lot. And this, one thing that, that I did that I wish I would have done more is there would even be times when I would go over to her apartment and I knew in my head, I'm like, I'm going to want to cross these boundaries. Like, I'm already thinking this way. And so I would call her and just let her know, hey, I, I'm already feeling and sensing these things. So I just want to let you know so we can just put some safeguards in now. Like, you know, maybe you've heard the term, like, nothing good happens after midnight. Yeah. And so I think it's important to find some of those triggers of what for you and your relationship leads you to where you don't want to go and set yourself up for success. Yeah. So I think I yeah. think that's huge. Hey, I appreciate your honesty, you know, and again, another sign of generational differences. When I was younger, the saying was nothing good happens after nine. So I guess <laughs> I guess it's just been pushed yes, back further, midnight, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Uh, but just know your time, right? <laughs> know your time limit. But no, I appreciate Taylor's honesty in the fact that, you know, we're not, even if we love Jesus, we're not robots. 
and, uh, and you're attracted to that person for a reason. And so being honest about that, I think is, is really good. Anything you guys would add? to what Yeah, you said? I, as you were talking, Taylor, I just was like reminded of a conversation that I had, oh man, years ago when the Detroit campus was kind of just getting started and um, Scott Crosby, who a lot of people from the Detroit campus will know, he's a buddy of mine and we were at a Tiger game and um, <clears throat> he was actually preaching that, that weekend at Wayne State at like the college ministry that he had helped to start at our campus, and I don't remember the specifics of what he was preaching on from a biblical standpoint, but I remember the conversation had to do with like storing up treasure in heaven. Yeah. And, um, and Scott was like just telling me about like his heart for uh, the reality of like decisions that we make today absolutely will affect tomorrow, but they have the ability and opportunity to affect eternity. And Scott was like, I don't know, he, he's always been like a, a mentor to me and a friend, and I just, I remember that conversation distinctly, because we were talking at it and coming at it from, from a perspective of like, as guys, like how we act, how we live, what we choose to do and not to do um, uh, with people and, and with ourselves, like it absolutely affects more than just you. Like the decisions that we make, they will affect friends, they'll affect family, they will affect a church community. Um, and just so that mindset of like, man, like, you know, we could choose to do this right now. We could choose to step into this. Yeah. Um, but the future me and the future us would be a lot more pleased and happy and better off if we decided like in this moment, like what you said, like, hey, let's take a safeguard. Hey, let's take a minute. And so I, like, I think back to that conversation with Scott quite often in my life, uh, coming at it from different perspectives of whatever you know, it is. I'm really glad through. that you brought that up because I think that one of the misnomers about sex uh, is that sex is all private, right? Yeah. And I always say this, that there's no such thing as private sex. And what I mean by that is exactly what you just said, is that what we do in private has uh, public consequences, community consequences. And you look at sexual ethics, like when we are honoring covenant and doing what we're supposed to do and, and uh, you know, honoring marriage and those things, it allows the community to flourish, right? But we all know what happens when we're breaking those things, divorce, distrust, remarriage, kids that are abandoned. I mean, all of these damages. So it's not a private, you know, a private thing. But I love that you talked about how your future self would thank you. Yeah. Me and my wife talk about so much how um, our willingness to abstain when we were dating, knowing how much we were attracted to each other has caused us to trust each other more in marriage. Yeah. Wow. Like, I feel like looking back to it, if we would have been compromising, then what would cause her to trust me that as I go out every day, right, and come across attractive women every day that I'm not going to compromise there, right? But if she can look back and say, knowing the integrity that uh, we were able to have each other, then it causes, you know, trust later. So I think Scott gave you great advice. Yeah, yeah, he, he always yeah. does. <laughs> Emily, anything? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I think just adding on to this, um, it's really important through dating um, to have people, other couples or just friends that you really trust, um, knowing your boundaries as well yeah. and um, confessing when you've messed up. Yeah. Um, I know for us, it was, this was very hard for us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we had to confess and we even had to sit down and we, we talked to Pastor John about it, which was just like, so hard to do and um you know like just really really wanting to fight for holiness in our relationship um before marriage and um you know he just challenged us of like this is you know your story and um like you can like jesus is so good and so big you can do this like you can meet these boundaries and um you yes and and doing in doing so this becomes your story for others to hear. And, you know, um, so I really am just so, um, and in and, and that as well, um, you know, I think that this was an area in my life that was always kind of just felt in the culture we live, it's, it's everywhere. And so it always kind of did feel like an area that I felt God was 
restrictive towards us and like, you know, holding back on this good thing, right? Um, and, you know, I've come to realize like being in marriage now uh, that, you know, God asks us to wait because of those feelings of shame and guilt and disappointment that come, right? Like he um, doesn't want us to experience that. He wants us to experience the the greatness in sex and in, in, your, in a healthy relationship and in your marriage. Um, so, yeah, just it's been really great for um, the Lord to just reveal that to me. And that is just something I'm very, cool. um, you know, just with my single friends and, you know, just sharing and being <laughs> real of how hard yeah. that is. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but uh, God is greater than that. And um, with him, you have the power to mm. meet your boundaries. And um, right. yeah. Well, I love the fact that you started with grace because we not have to know that there is forgiveness. So for those who are struggling and maybe you find yourself in a moment where you say, man, we have blown it. Um, I, I do want you to know that God can restore, uh, but he is big enough to help us to live into his story and not into, uh, into our failures. All right, so I guess Taylor uh, and, and Pat, uh, you guys work for the church. Uh, Emily, obviously you're a small group leader. What can the church do uh, to come alongside singles to really help them? Pat, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean. In this area of yeah, dating. I love this question because, I don't know, man, I just feel like so often there's just this pressure that comes from, I'm just gonna say the church, but a lot of times it's just the people in the church. Um, you know, I'm blessed to be at a campus that a lot of young people, I was just telling them before we started, a lot of college students, um, a lot of young middle-aged 20 year olds. Um, I'm 32, but I've been down there for the last eight years and, and I've been in different relationships and so I've experienced what I'm speaking into. And um, I just think that there's this like pressure within the church that the minute somebody finds out, oh, so-and-so are not even dating, but like, oh, they're talking. Yeah. It's like, ooh, when's the wedding? Yeah. Oh, like here's, like, here's five books. Don't make, make sure you do. And it's like, in my mind, a lot of it comes back to the whole social media thing. And like for Jennifer and I, I mean, we never, we're not on Facebook, like official or anything like that, but it took, it took us like both like intentionally five months of, and partially it's, I think, because of just my position as associate pastor, but it took us like five months of just getting to know each other and only sharing with a couple people because we really wanted to begin our relationship with like a sense of freedom to just get to know each other. And sometimes I think in church culture, um, that is almost like stripped away, sadly from people, the ability to just get to know each other. And so when I think about like, what could the church do better? What could the church have in place? Like, I mean, this is probably one of the most important reasons that we should be pursuing a multi-generational church is because we need older, more experienced couples that are able to come alongside and speak in. And not from a perspective of, hey, it's been like three weeks. Like, is he the one? You need to know. But more about just like, hey, how are you doing? Like, hey, we heard that's so incredible. But just want you to know there's no pressure. Like, there's no timeline here. You do you, enjoy the process. We'd love to get a coffee. We'd love to have dinner. Even like a one-on-one -on -one type deal, like guy to guy. Like, just more like mentoring and encouraging and less like pressure. I love it. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's real. Listen, you guys are pretty incredible. And I appreciate you guys being honest and transparent. There's a lot of ground that we did not cover. And so what we're gonna do is put resources in the postscript so that you guys can go a little bit deeper. Maybe like Emily, you're looking for a little bit of advice, but you're gonna get a whole checklist. <laughs> you're gonna get reading recommendations yes. and everything so you can go deep, but it's because we, we love you. Can I pray for you guys? Can I do that? And for our friends who are watching as well, let me do that. Uh, Father, first off, thank you. Thank you for every season of life because you're in every season of life and you use it for your purposes and for your glory. Lord, thank you for singleness.
lives, uh, it's a blessing and help us to see it as a gift that we can give back to you. And I pray right now for all of our single friends and family members who are watching the Lord, that this will be a season uh, of fruitfulness and flourishing. And Lord, um, for our, even our married couples, I pray that they would not stop dating, uh, that they wouldn't let the pressures of life in this world and parenting and work and a mortgage and all of those things uh, keep them from prioritizing you and, uh, and one another. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that you would uh, bless Pat and, uh, and Jen, uh, that your hand would be upon them. The Lord, I pray uh, for, for Emily to have joy, for uh, Lord, you to continue to bless uh, their marriage to just be a shining light, not only in our Royal Oak campus, uh, but Lord, even through, throughout their social group, their friendship group, their community as well. And Lord, I, I so thank you for Taylor, uh, for his investment in the next generation. And I just pray that as he lives out his convictions, the Lord, that it would be uh, such a witness uh, to the ones that he's pouring into. Uh, bless uh, Haley and her um, residency as well and just continue to let your hand be upon them. Uh, Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this conversation. Uh, we we uh, dedicate it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, friends, I hope that this was a blessing for you. Uh, please know that we want to continue to support you. And what I love about Emily's testimony is how her pastor played a key role. Please know that everyone of your campus pastors at Woodside want to play a key role. And if you're outside of Woodside, still go to your pastor so that they can be a part of your journey and, uh, and know that we will continue to pray for you. Hey, I can't wait until the next edition of The Link. Make sure you join us.